welcome to another of our ongoing discussions on the Old Testament. I'm Paul Hoskison, and I am joined today by three colleagues from the Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left, D. Kelly Ogden. Across the table from me, Eric Huntsman. And to my right, Michael Rhodes. We want to welcome you all here, and I'm glad that you're here to share this experience with us. Last time we discussed the, the, the beginning of the decline of King David and the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. Today we'll be discussing the, uh, the uh, near end of uh, David's kingdom and finishing up the book of Samuel. We'll be discussing chapters 13 through 24 today. Let's begin in chapter 13 of 2 Samuel. With yet another tawdry tale. Yeah. And, and Although at the end of chapter 12 we need to mention that after that uh, first child of theirs was born, they had another child who is going to become the king. Yes, that's right. His name? Solomon. We call him Solomon. Jedediah. Shlomo, but Yedidiah is his real name, which is very similar to his father's name. David, David, beloved. This is beloved of the Lord. And it's interesting in verse 25 that Nathan, who rebuked David and Bathsheba for the original affair and was not involved with the first child, that he's involved with Solomon right here. It says that he's sent by the hand of Nathan when he names him Jedediah. Yes. But his throne name, as we all know, is Solomon, Solomon. which uh, ha preserves that uh, ancient name of the place even. All oh, right. Shalom, Shalem, Salem is what the place had been known as earlier times, so now we have a, another king using the same name at this place. Moving on now into chapter 13, as Nathan had promised earlier that opposition would come to David from within his own house, uh, the first opposition that happens uh, comes from Absalom, uh, David's beloved oh, son. Amnon, actually, well, right? Amnon, well, the son, a, a, is a prologue to the whole revolt yes, of Absalom. Yes, Amnon is going to commit a terrible crime against Absalom's sister. And Amnon's half-sister. Yes. So this is an incestuous yeah. situation. And Amnon is actually the heir to the throne. I mean, he's the firstborn. Or the eldest at this point. Uh, the, yeah, exactly. The, yes. the eldest at this point. Uh, although the, uh, it, it wasn't always the eldest who was the immediate uh, 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 heir to the throne. Uh, usually there was a, a prince designate right. who was supposed to uh, become the heir and sometimes even reigned uh, in a co-regency with the reigning king until the, the Which king happens with David and Solomon, in yes. fact. Yes. Well, uh, 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 Michael, do you want to tell us uh, what happens with Amnon? Well, it's, it, it's, it's almost poetic justice here. Amnon is, is, is basically committing the same sort of crime uh, that his father yeah. did, having uh, illicit uh, relations outside of uh, marriage. Uh, and could this we can insert right here, Michael, that, that David has lost the spirit because of his sins. He doesn't recognize what's happening. So he's not... Well, he eventually position, finds out. he's not in a position to stop it from happening. He eventually finds out and, and, and is, is very angry about it, but, you know, He's basically doing the same thing as, as I did. How can I punish him for something that, that I myself have done? Which really so, shows us the problem we get into when we ourselves transgress. It makes us less effective as fathers or as parents. Exactly. Uh, so often, unfortunately, you know, abusers are abused. They're the children of other abusers, and these kind of particularly sexual problems get perpetuated. And as you say, how can someone who has not been living the commandments insist his children does? Children do. Yes. Now this uh, episode here with Amnon and his uh, half sister Tamar uh, is is not just something that happens out of the blue. Uh, mm -hmm. Amnon is going to uh, plot this and much and like David had plotted. And, and and it. It. This yeah. is very premeditated. He, first of all, he wants permission from David in in uh, to allow Tamar to come in and and and. Uh, uh, administer him because he's going to pretend like he's sick mm -hmm. and and that way he can get his half-sister to come into the quarters where she might otherwise not have been allowed to come and then he sends all the servants out so that he can uh, you know have privacy to to uh, work his will on her and then you know uh, most shameful of all after after he he does this then he it says he hated her he didn't want any more to do with right. her and, Interesting and, and lesson. shuns her yeah and so, uh, uh, just a, a, a terrible uh, affair all the way around. 
quite literally. Yes. <laughs> yes. As you say, when it's over, King David, verse 21, hears of, hears of these things and he's very, very angry, well. but we don't see him do anything. Right, no. And this causes Absalom, Sorry. Tamar's sister, brother, to go too far to try to vindicate her. Yeah. Now she is his full uh, Say the same uh, full sister, yeah, the yeah. full sister, and, and she's gone into mourning in verse 19 because of what has happened. And Absalom, of course, picks up on this. And as you mentioned, David does nothing in verse 21. So Absalom is, uh, Absalom is not stupid. Uh, he's a man of the world. He knows how to get along in the world, and he's going to bide his time until the time is right to get revenge uh, for what uh, his half-brother has done to his full sister. So he sets the trap. He has Absalom come to, what is it, a sheep shearing party? Mm -hmm. And he tells his servants when he's good and drunk uh, and really Absalom. can't defend himself. When Amnon. Absalom says when Amnon's good and drunk. Now, it's not just Amnon that's invited. It's all, all the king's the, sons. Yeah, right. So no one suspects anything because Absalom has made sure everybody is going to be there, including the one that he wants, Amnon. Hmm. Yes. This is uh, as premeditated on Absalom's part as Amnon's seduction of uh, Tamar was on his part. Mm -hmm. There's an interesting thing I think sometimes about Hebrew scripture and that is they, they, they will tell you a story and not uh, give you the moral at the end of the story. They expect the reader to figure out the moral. Often it's very easy to figure out the moral. That is, uh, uh, Amnon did something very terribly wrong and Absalom is going to do something equally as wrong in return for this. What's interesting here is that the way the writer set it up, that, that Amnon is premeditated and careful to, to get done what he wants. And now Absalom is going to do the same thing mm -hmm. to Amnon. He's going to be premeditated and carefully set up the situation. They're learning evilly very well from each other, <laughs> generation after yeah, generation. Amnon yeah. here learns from his father. Absalom learns from his father and his brother. And it just compounds as, and, as and it goes we're forward. That, that the curse that... Uh, Nathan pronounced uh, just uh, expanding. Kelly, uh, now Absalom was that? Does that mean father of peace? What's his name mean? Of Shalom. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so here we have someone whose name means father of peace, but he's doing anything but perpetuating peace in the family. Yes. And soon we'll see this become a revolt when he not only causes problems within the family, but actually divides the kingdom. Well, and when this happens, when the servants of Absalom kill Amnon, uh, Amnon uh, everyone else is Please. afraid for their own lives. Right. Right. And, and I want to mention one little thing here in the, in the end of verse 29. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him up upon his mule and fled. Now, normally we would think, a mule for the king's sons, you know? Well, these want, are imports, aren't they? Because you, you can't have horse. mules if you're... Well, they don't ride horses as consistently that, at this period. That, that's the point that I'm making, is that it really is inappropriate in this, in this day for people to ride horses, especially royalty. You don't ride a horse. This comes into Near Eastern custom later on with the, with the Persians and, and with the Greeks. Mm -hmm. At this point, the donkey is really a sign of royalty and not the horse. Now, and in so, the Hebrew, is it, is it mule or is it donkey? No, it's mule here, as, as I remember correctly. Because hybrids, I mean, Leviticus 19 actually forbids this forbids kind of thing. This, so these yes. must have been imported luxury mounts. But Solomon himself, as we see shortly, is going to go to his coronation on the king's mule, which that's is right. a type of, of something that's going to come centuries that's right. later. That's right. We actually have a, tes a text from the ancient Near East where the king's advisor, not from Israel, from outside, from Mesopotamia, where the king's advisor says, kings don't ride on horses. They're supposed to ride on mules. Interesting. And, sure, it just put so, the triumphal entry in a different context. Though, and, and, it? and it really does put the triumphal entry and, and, and the prophecy. But what we see here in, in the uh, Old Testament is the, uh, that this is, actually holds true in Israel also. The kings do not ride horses. They ride something else, like a mule or a donkey, right. yes. Uh, um, <laughs> our, our listeners would want to know that unlike some places of the world, the Western world, a uh, 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 donkey or an ass is not a... a uh, dumb brute BC you have to whack with a board to get its attention. <laughs> in that part of the world, it's a very respected animal. Always has been and still yes. is. So, um, yeah. so the kings get on their mules, and the well, king's the princes, sons, right. and, and flee the scene. And David, uh, and, and David has brought word in the rest of the chapter and is worried about the rest of them, but no one had to worry about anything except Amnon. And Amnon now is dead, and Absalom has had his revenge, but Absalom also knows he's that in he's trouble. in trouble. So he flees to his 
grandpa's houses. And Verse 37, and Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of uh, Amichud, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't mention whether this is Amnon he's mourning for or Absalom that he's mourning for. He's probably mourning for both. Right. Because as far as he's concerned, they're, they're both dead, one well, physically and, and one spiritually. Well, supports Absalom because the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom. Yeah. For he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. Yes. So uh, David seems to have a, a, almost a, a uh, perverted love for Absalom, no matter what he does. Well, displacement, he, you yeah. know, it's so oftentimes the good child in a dysfunctional family doesn't get the attention, but the problem, but, ones, yeah. the problem children do. Yeah, it's true. really interesting in chapter 14 how they bring Absalom back, though. Um, Absalom flees to this other king, this nearby kingdom. It's and actually related to his mother. And but, we have to mention Joab here, who is one right. of the king's uh, uh, chief military And he's officers. actually a nephew, I think, isn't he? Uh, the, uh, the sons of Zaria. He, he's a real man of the world and understands things, and he is going to work in the best interests of what he thinks are the best interests of his master, King David. What was it so he, interesting to me so about this, though, it. it's tricky. He has this wise woman, they call her, yes. come and tell a parable. And there's an interesting comparison and contrast with chapter 12. When David did something wrong, a prophet came and told a parable, and it was too late. David couldn't do anything about it. In chapter 14, Joab gets this wise woman come and tell the story about how her two sons fought, and one killed the other, and everyone wanted to kill that one, but she lost one son. Can't she have the one back? And David says yes. And then they they bring they bring um, Absalom back. I just think it was interesting that he hearkens to this wise woman, hmm. whereas he hadn't been hearkening to prophetic counsel earlier. I just thought it was interesting. There are two parables, and the, re the reactions are so different. And uh, David is not to be fooled with this, because in verse 19, David says, "Is not the hand of Joab with yeah. thee in all of this?" When the woman says it's you, David sees through this. Yeah. David is, is uh, he may have lost his spirit uh, uh, when uh, he committed his terrible sins, but he is, he's not stupid yet. And he sees through this and recognizes, yes, we have to do this. So he allows Absalom to come back. Uh, into his presence, eventually into his yeah, presence. Yeah, he actually comes home for a couple years and doesn't ever see the king, but eventually when things die down and feelings calm down, he meets him. But there's just an interesting reference I just want to point out. It seems like a strange detail. In verse 25 and 26, it talks about how beautiful Absalom was. So he returns home, and even before he's completely reconciled with his father, he's praised for his whole for his beauty. There's no one in all Israel that's as beautiful as he is. And when he cuts his hair, when he pulls his head... The pulling there means to cut his yeah, hair. Yeah, when he has his hair cut, it weighs two and a shekel which is what, somewhere between three and six pounds. He's got this big mane of hair. And I, I just wonder how that played into his personality and his behavior. He obviously is a good-looking man, has these good physical characteristics, and he knows it. And I wonder how much that plays into his attitude towards his father, towards his sister, towards his behavior. And in memory of his, uh, his sister, he names apparently one of his daughters, daughters Tamar, Tamar, after her also. Yes. Interesting. And he dwells a couple of years uh, 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 apart from the king and never sees him. And eventually, uh, uh, he is uh, allowed to return into the king's presence. Going on now to chapter 15, uh, Absalom gains a bit of uh, um, chutzpah, we could say. I, and he's going to try something uh, here that uh, it, it will eventually be his demise, and that is, in, in chapter 15, he decides that he is, uh, uh, he wants to be the king of Israel. Mm. And, and steal the hearts of the men of Israel, verse 6. Yes. And where does he do it? He goes to Hebron, which is where which David is 20 miles king. south of Jerusalem, which is the heart of the tribe of Judah. That's where David was first right. king. So he's going to win over some hearts there and then lead a force against his own father. Yes. And uh, in verse 10, uh, this man of the world, Absalom, uh, sends spies throughout all the tribes of Israel to find out how they're, uh, how they're going to react to this. And some buy into it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, in verse 13, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And therefore, he's going to declare himself king. And David then is in, uh, is, uh, in danger. 
uh, if Absalom now, who is in Hebron, the ancestral home of the has house the support of, David, of David's own tribe, has the support of his own tribe, and now has the support of at least uh, uh, some of the other tribes of Israel, uh, David is in mortal danger now. And and a pitiable scene in verse 30 of chapter 15. David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet, uh, just to the east of the city of David, is we, the we, Mount of Olives. We have to say here that what he's doing now, he is, he is fleeing. He's counseled he, with his people. He doesn't his want people. warfare going on right in his own city and where the temple is and all, so he decides yes, to leave uh, head covered, barefoot. Uh, what a a pitiable scene. And he's fleeing from the place. Uh, I, I think there's some, some wonderful parallels here that we need to bring out. You, well, really very Eric? interesting because the, the verse that Kelly began to mention, verse 30, he goes up on the Mount of Olives and of course we know of a lot of important associations with that spot and there seems to be some resonance. The gospel authors were aware of this, that David, the anointed king, was rejected by his people and he mourns and he suffers for them and there is actually a little bit of resonance with what happens when the Savior, rejected by his people, goes to Gethsemane and he mourns Stands and he suffers. Right there on the Mount of Olives, lamenting out over the and leaves. Place. And yet he's going to come back. David will come back, and the Savior will come back to his people too. Paul, who is it who greets David when he does finally come back? Uh, other, I don't remember. Shimei is the is, yeah. the, is the one, who, one of the ones who greets him. But when but, he comes into the city the people accept him the as their do. king. And so you have that, that parallelism. The, the triumphal entry. Of Christ, right. yes. and, the, and the final coming when he comes in glory. Yes, yes. Well, and uh, uh, um, Absalom then flees uh, because now he is in mortal danger. Uh, David has succeeded uh, in taking back the, uh, the throne in Jerusalem, uh, eventually will. But uh, um, in the meantime, um, Absalom uh, gets some bad advice from somebody that David has planted yeah. there in the See, royal double house. Agent. Double agent. A, a yeah. double agent here. And uh, instead of pursuing uh, David immediately, as his good advisor uh, um, uh, uh, told him to do, he delays. And this gives David, of course, a chance to get further away and to organize and to be prepared. Well, of course, you remember the beginning of David's career, he started out as a guerrilla fighter. If he can gather strength and get out the hills of the Judean wilderness, he can hold his own. And that's why, that's why Absalom's advisor said, go out and get him right now while they're tired, they're hungry, they're dispirited. But the plant, this was, who is it, who's shy? A friend of David's, that David said, go back and pretend you're on Absalom's side. He talked Absalom into not attacking right away. So that's curious how this plays out. Yes, and, and in all of this, um, a, 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 as David leaves, he's mocked by a, a certain people and uh, made fun of, they throw rocks at him. And uh, after Absalom moves into Jerusalem, uh, he's advised that he should take uh, the uh, concubines that David left behind to watch over the house and, and take them as his wives. And, and the reason for this is that this is uh, a claim to the kingship. This is one of the ways that he can claim to be the legitimate king. So in, the new king in, takes the previous king's harem. And yes, and, and uh, these become his wives, and this is one more uh, claim to the throne. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to backfire on him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> eventually, uh, Absalom gathers up his forces and sends them after David to mm -hmm. capture David and to, uh, and to kill him. And uh, David, in the meantime, has rallied his forces, and um, uh, there, there's a, a battle that's going to happen in chapter 18 now. And David is advised, don't go out and fight. Let us fight the battle for you. So Joab and two of the other generals go out and lead the battle, and the forces of Absalom are routed. And we need to read the part there where Absalom himself then this is, uh, 18, nine. Uh, is, is, uh, is caught. Yeah. So, uh, so Absalom is free, fleeing. Um, he rode upon his mule, and the mule went out from under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. Usually the image we get is that because of this <laughs> big head of hair that he's so proud of, that as he went through this, these branches, kind of like a thicket, that his hair got caught in the tree, and the mule kept riding, and he was stuck, and so he's caught hanging there. Yes, he's caught hanging there, and it's reported to Joab. Uh, this is uh, David's general and the one who wants to look out for David's interests and, uh, 
and, and the interests of the kingdom uh, that uh, Absalom is hanging there. Now, David had specifically given orders earlier that no one Not to harm him. was to harm Absalom, that Absalom was to be left alive. And Joab knows that if this happens, there's going to be trouble in the future. And uh, Joab is going to see to it that Absalom is killed. Uh, he thinks this is going to be a service to David. And uh, no one wants to do it because of the command of David not to kill Joab, uh, not to kill um, Absalom. Absalom. So Joab actually has to do it himself and uh, first shoots some dart. it says darts or arrows into him. And, uh, and Joab's uh, retainers, the young men with him, they all join in and, and then they stab him. They throw his body into a pit and heap a bunch of stones on it there in verse 17. Yes. And of course, this exculpates David. David's not responsible for the death of Absalom. Yes. The narrative makes that Joab's responsibility and, and Absalom's. I mean, if Absalom hadn't, he's kind of hubris with his hair, you know, maybe he had not been caught. Yes. And then we get the interesting story of, uh, of two messengers uh, reporting the victory of the battle uh, there, uh, beginning in verse 19 of uh, chapter 18, where one person wants to report it, but Joab sends uh, uh, someone else to report. And you wonder why the contest here, I, it's probable that in those days messengers were rewarded especially if they brought good news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, normally you don't kill a messenger who brings brad bad news, but you reward the one who brings good news. And in this case, uh, Joab wants to send um, a Cushi, and he does, but this uh, other fellow named uh, Ahimaz wants to go also and actually outruns Cushi and arrives there first. But he's smart enough in verse 29, and the king said, Is the young man Absalom alive? And Ahimaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, and me, thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. What, He's what going to plead innocence. He doesn't know whether Absalom is okay or not. Mm. So when the second messenger arrives, Cushi, the, one of the, the last questions he's going to ask him in verse 32, is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushi answered, the enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that young man is. Some, Cushi knows the answer. He's, he has uh, not enough discretion to, um, to withhold that kind of news. Well, and then, of course, David weeps for his son, 33. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. Would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son. And this is, once again, David's uh, punishment. He was told by Nathan that he would suffer in his house, and he's suffering the loss of all that's dear to him. Well, one of the great tragedies of the Old Testament, David and his son Absalom. Mm -hmm. uh, the, this is the work of poetry here. Now, the next couple chapters are mostly kind of historical things, aren't they? The, the fighting he does and the different problems, but there's some interesting things the last three chapters we might want to touch on while we have some time with our listeners. Let us go to turn uh, to 22. Uh, we, uh, in, in the meantime, back in uh, uh, chapter uh, uh, 19, David does return in triumph sure. to Jerusalem, is welcomed. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the northern tribes, uh, what we uh, will call afterwards Israel, right. are the first to welcome David. They, they send ambassadors and say, well, Absalom, the king is dead. We might as well welcome David back. We don't have much of, another, of any other choice. And uh, Judah delays a little while, and David says, Paul, What's this is what I was you? asking you earlier when we were comparing yes. leaving on the Mount of Olives to, the, to Gethsemane and the Passion of the Lord and his rejection. Because when you, when you talked about this earlier, you mentioned that when David comes back, Israel was the first to receive him, but Judah dragged its feet or was slow. And so there's a little bit of the first would be last, the last would be first. And modern-day Israel, those who are accepting the gospel, are accepting Christ and are ready for his return. But Judah, it seems at this point in history, is a little slow at recognizing and receiving him. And that's, that's what I was trying to recall you saying yes. earlier. I think that's a wonderful yes. parallel. And, and David gets after him. He says, you, my kinsman, why were you so slow to welcome me back? Which You're the one who makes me think of Zechariah, should, the yes, prophecy in exactly. Zechariah. That, the prophecy in Zechariah about his kinsman, right. yes. Hmm. Yes. You wanted to mention, Eric, the last words. David. Oh, yes. the last words of David, very yes. important. Um, chapter 22, we probably don't need to go over it now, but chapter 22 is interesting because it's a psalm like we'll be seeing in subsequent um, sessions as we talk. It's 
very similar to Psalm 18. It's David talking about how the Lord has rescued him. But in chapter 23, we have these famous last words of David. Now, actually, David has a few more chapters here and in Kings. But chapter 23, first, verse 1 starts out, Now, these be the last words of David. And it says that he's uh, inspired by the Spirit of the Lord. And he says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds. This has been set to a wonderful musical piece by Randall Thompson, The Last Words of David. It's, it's poignant because here's David, who has been such a good ruler, but then done so many bad things in his personal life. And he is laying out this principle, He that is going to lead men and women must be just. I think of Moriant in the book of Ether. He did justice to his people, but not to himself. Those who are leaders must be just in how they rule, and they must be just to themselves. But we've got some wonderful advice for those who are, are political and other leaders. Ruling in the fear of God. Yes, please. One of my students mentioned one time in this account, uh, one of the great qualities of leadership is the ability to be in control of oneself. Right. One of the reasons Moses was so great is because he was meek. Right. One of the meekest of men. We, we sometimes associate meekness with weakness, but no, meekness is a strength. Meekness is power under control. And David had great power, but he lost control. And, and the, the, the tragedy here of, he, he had, in his better days, he knew. And he had a, a great relationship with the Lord as the sweet psalmist in well, his Well, chapter 23, those, those contrasts and those ironies are so strong. Here's David saying, He that ruleth over men must be just, to himself as well as to others. And the rest of the chapter just seems kind of routine. It's this long list or catalog of his warriors. But the last person mentioned in verse 39, after it mentions all of David's mighty men, is Uriah the Hittite. And so we're left with this memory of how this all went wrong. wrong. He was not yes. in control of himself yes. in the matter of Uriah and Bathsheba. And we need to mention very quickly in chapter 24 when David wants to conduct the census uh, in, in verse 1, and again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number the Israel and Judah. Uh, Chronicles makes the correction there, and, and rightly so, that uh, the one who moved, against, uh, moved David against them is Satan. Mm -hmm. that it's the devil. And, and there's a punishment then that comes on him for, okay. for conducting the census, obviously for military purposes, uh, trying to rely on the arm of the Lord. And I think... On the military flesh. Right, on the military power of the Lord, On the arm of flesh. And I think that's one of the main lessons that we get out of the book of Samuel, out of David's life, that relying on the arm of flesh doesn't get you very far. This isn't the David who single-handedly, with the Lord's help, fought Goliath. Yes. He's now relying on right. the hundreds and thousands of people he can number. Yes, and yes. we in these days need to learn to rely on the arm of the Lord also. That's Thank lesson. you. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.